Socialism is still a loaded term for a lot of folks. Once again, instead of talking labels and ideology, we should focus on talking about getting certain things done. I guess you can use a snappy slogan like defund the police, but you know you've lost a big audience the minute you say it. Governor Gavin Newsom dining both maskless and indoors at the fancy French laundry restaurant. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot celebrating in the non-socially distant streets of her city. Speaker Nancy Pelosi indoors at a hair salon in San Francisco when salons in California were only open for outdoor services. CNN's Chris Cuomo staging his emergence from quarantine in a made-for-television moment coming out of the basement, and this was after uh, Cuomo was spotted breaking his brother, Governor Cuomo's, quarantine rules to go for a bike ride. San Francisco Mayor London Breed, who followed Governor Newsom's lead in dining at the French Laundry with a group of eight people. Los Angeles County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl dining outdoors at her favorite Santa Monica restaurant after voting to ban outdoor dining. And believe it or not, there are a boat mo- boat mo- <laughs> there are a boatload more than that. In just the last few hours and days, man, they are, it's a full court press to blow off your own COVID (laughs) rules and go have a great time. The latest guy is in like Cabo or something. Mm-hmm. Who's uh, somebody in Texas? That they're falling all over the place. Yeah. I don't even know. John Bell Edwards was at a country club with no mask on, hanging out like the day before he put in new restrictions. They are just <laughs> living it up. They're either they are sure that it's the end of the world coming soon, or they're sure that there's no harm whatsoever in going out and enjoying life. Or but- they think what a lot of people think, which is that I've heard the risks i know which are the more dangerous activities and i can make a decision what my personal risk tolerance is you know that's what everybody else should be allowed to do that's what we all want to be able to do we it's not like no one's heard of covid now right you know like we as all long know as, about as it. As long as, as long as those, we, we should all be able to do that. As long as, long as they don't serve uh, peanut butter there, or else Alice Shattuck will <laughs> shut you down. Keep those comments coming on social media, by the way, for Alice Shattuck. Do not stand for this tyrant in our midst. I don't. I don't think the place shouldn't be allowed to exist. I just think it's a bad choice. I think they'll lose people. That's my opinion. I- mm Hmm. Well, That's, we are. Uh, well, we'll see who's who proven right. We'll see who's proven right. I mean, first of all, I'm not going to go there and pay ten bucks to feed my kid a peanut butter sandwich that I could make at home for thirty cents. Tacking so. business again. Yep. You didn't build that PB and J. No, I just. Says I think Shattuck. it's. I. That's fine, but even if I didn't have a peanut allergic kid, I probably wouldn't go there. I don't find it that compelling. And The theme of today, though, Alice, the theme of today will be socialism then and now. Today, Barack Obama, former President Barack Obama, started a uh, spat with his squad. He has had just about enough of this stuff. And it, though he also, at one point, was um, was was careful to, uh, you know, offer an olive branch to AOC, the, the squad is not having it. They are mad at Obama. He lit them up today. He is going right at, right at the the defund the police, uh, you know, uh, the faction, which is a huge, obviously energized faction. We saw this year, this summer, what happened. All streets were renamed, and everybody's writing stuff in yellow all over the place. All the statues have to come down every time ever. It doesn't even matter. Um, who did it? Lincoln statues have to come down. All, this cultural unraveling that we saw this summer. So the socialists, who are all for this, all for uh, dismantling these systems, they love this stuff. And they see they see there are even greener pastures in the next few months. They don't care that they were blown out in a lot of races in states and around the country. And that the, the Republicans managed to win seats because Americans, by and large, do not want woke USA happening. They don't want to defund the police. Obama had the uh, audacity today to say that. If you believe, as as I do, that we should be able to reform the criminal justice system so that it's not biased and treats everybody fairly, I guess you can use a snappy slogan like, 
defund the police, but you know you've lost a big audience the minute you say it, which makes it a lot less likely that you're actually going to get the changes you want done. But if you instead say, let's reform the police department so that everybody's being treated fairly, you know, divert young people from getting into crime, and if there's a homeless guy, can maybe we send a mental health worker there instead of an armed unit that could end up resulting in a tragedy? So- Already you can tell the Fisher here, o- Obama thinks that defund the police is a useful term for sloganeering. But no, no, no. That is the platform of the far left for the socialists, for the squad. Suddenly, a whole bunch of folks who might not otherwise listen to you are listening to you. So the key is deciding, do you want to actually get something done or do you want to feel good among the people you already agree with? And if you want to get something done in a democracy, in a country as big and diverse as ours, then you've got to be able to meet people where they are and play a, a game of addition and not subtraction. No, uh, no. Some uh, Somebody with a useless degree from BU clapped back at him for saying that. They don't want to meet you where they are, meet people where they are. They want to make people feel uncomfortable. Remember, it's about getting their faces, making people feel uncomfortable, intimidating the change. Socialism is still a loaded term for a lot of folks. Once again, instead of talking labels and ideology, we should focus on talking about getting certain things done. Ooh, uh, no, 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 no. And that was throwing down the gauntlet today. In just a minute, we are going to talk to Anthony Amori, who wrote a fantastic book about one of the previous generation's big socialist, overeducated, uh, white collar, privileged life, but became like AOC and so many others. And, and, you know, all these kids throwing, uh, you know, bottles of urine at police from Wellesley in Dover, Massachusetts. Overeducated, degreed, all up to the yin yang, and, and but they want to find a purpose, and that purpose they're going to find through socialist causes and insurgencies. Well, there's a woman who did that in, I guess it was almost 50 years now who essentially lived in the, the, a life of Downton Abbey, and she was in England. Her name is Rose Dugdale, and if you don't mm-hmm. know anything about her, she's got quite a story, and uh, she took this uh, socialist mantle to a new new level. And we'll be talking to uh, Anthony in just a moment about that. But very quickly, Obama didn't just torch the squad. He did uh, politely pat them on the heads, which they did not take <laughs> well. We stick so long with the same old folks and don't make room for... The swishes you hear are Peter Hamby. This is his interview. He's somebody on Twitter and on Snapchat, and mm-hmm. he, he overproduces crap, so you're hearing his special effects. New voices. You know, the Democratic National Convention, I thought, was really successful considering the pandemic, but you know, the fact that an AOC only got, what, three minutes or five minutes. Good evening, bienvenidos, and thank you. When, you know, she speaks to a broad section of young people who are interested in what she has to say, even if they don't agree with everything she says, new blood's always good. And I I say that as somebody who uh, used to be the young, shiny, cool guy, but uh, (laughs) now is the gray-haired old grizzled vet. Yeah, the gray is pretty rad. (laughs) Keep keep it together, Peter. Okay. (laughs) So you see where he's coming from. So that is uh, what has happened, and the squad is has uh, returned the salvo directly at the president. Right. So all four official members of the squad, plus their latest recruit, Corey, President Obama. That is. I'm sorry. Um, go ahead. All four of members of the squad, plus their latest recruit, Corey Bush, um, have fired at the former president on Twitter. Um, Alon Omar uh, said that uh, activists. Um, sorry. She said, we lose people to the hands of police. It's not a slogan, but a policy demand. And centering the demand for equitable investments in budgets for communities across the country gets us progress and safety. Tlaib said, Rosa Parks was vilified and attacked for her civil disobedience. She wrote, she was targeted. It's hard seeing the same people who uplift her courage attack the movement for black lives that want us to prioritize health, funding of schools, and ending poverty rather than racist police systems. Oh, God. Um, AOC said the point of activism and protest is to make people uncomfortable. The thing that critics of activists don't get. The point of activism is to make people uncomfortable. So in other words, be a loud, belligerent jerk. And for that, you'll be rewarded. Mm -hmm. The jerkier, the better. Lay in the middle of the street and stop traffic or throw stuff at police or take over uh, businesses or 
whatever it takes to intimidate, whatever it takes, put pe- make, keep people uncomfortable. It shows just proof that they're culpable because if they're not joining you, they're obviously a counterforce. Right. So she said the thing that critics of activists don't get is that they tried playing the polite language policy game and all it did was make them easier to ignore. It wasn't until they made folks uncomfortable that there was traction to do anything, even if it wasn't their full demands. Presley said the murders of generations of unarmed black folks by police have been horrific. Lives are at stake daily, so I'm out of patience with critiques of the language of activists. Whatever a grieving family says is their truth, and I'll never stop fighting for their justice and healing. Uh, This is um, also Jamal Bowman from New York's 16th Congressional District. He's a new one. He whacked out Elliot Engel, I think. Right. Yeah. He said... Damn, Mr. President, didn't you say Trayvon could have been my son? In 2014, Black Lives Matter was too much. The problem is America's comfort with black death, not discomfort with slogans. And then, um, let's see, where's Cori Bush? Good old Cori Bush. She's here somewhere, too. Um, We played Cori Bush last week making demands on Biden. She's the new congresswoman from uh, Michael Brown's district right. from Ferguson the from that area she's not from Ferguson but she became involved in that um in that whole thing from that and uh, and she went on Colbert last night with um with a black lives matter sweater on and talked about it too saying that we have to show up and make change and all this stuff too so she's all they're all in on it so I- Obviously, we find this delicious because this is the the civil war brewing in the Democratic Party and amongst uh, amongst um, progressives, and they deserve it. Pretty soon, Colbert's going to have to make a choice on his TV show, and he's going to have to decide what kind of really good person he is: what, a Joe Biden really good person or a Black Lives Matter really good person. And he's going to be uh, laid to waste in the, in not the violent sense, but in the brand credibility sense for the left, because he is not capable of making that kind of decision. Was he going to say, no, we're not having the Black Lives Matter guests on some, somehow? Is he going to castigate or denigrate them? Stephen Colbert? Privileges are abound with Stephen Colbert. Right. So, I mean, all these people are kind of like how Obama said about them, even though they don't like the description, I assume. They're like the shiny new person right. in media they're all darlings everyone loves aoc that's what made aoc's stories about how people treated her as the help in congress so ridiculous she is the most famous person in washington dc right now aoc mm-hmm. and certainly among people 30 and under she's the most famous person so right uh, you know the, these are the people that you want to be able to get on your show they're driving policy they're fully elected people and they're absolutely going to drive the conversation from here on out. Yes, and these they come full, full, full circle and it's generational. Barack Obama certainly had, to, as a community organizer, had more socialist tendencies, or dog whistles, we'll say. Um, and you know, one of his mentors was Bill Ayers. Bill Ayers with the Weather Underground. And you know, one of his contemporaries was a woman named Rose Dugdale, who is a, a part of the English gentry, a young woman in her uh, in her 20s, like, really like AOC and those folks. Is AOC 30 yet? Maybe she is. Yeah, she's 30. And uh, okay. Rose Dugdale wanted to make a name for herself in the insurgency as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we hear all about it. There's a new book out that goes through this. And it, pay attention to this because I, I just think it's a remarkable, the parallels that we find between then and now. This is our interview with... Um, uh, we're be talking to Anthony Amori. All right, I am always happy, thrilled to talk to Anthony Amori, who is a friend of mine here in Boston. But he's also, among other things, Jesus, is there anything you don't do, Anthony? He is uh, the author of a book that has uh, just come out in the last uh, month or so, called "The Woman Who Stole Vermeer: The True Story of Rose Dugdale and the Ros- Rustboro House-, House Art Heist." Um, okay, first of all, did I pronounce Dugdale correctly, Anthony? You did, it was perfect. And Rustboro. Perfect. I never know, it could be Worcestershire, Worcestershire. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anthony, this book, um, it, it, it couldn't have been more timely, because you have a woman here who's, uh, she's, uh, she's an English woman, correct? Correct. 
And Rose Dugdale is somebody who lives in a big, beautiful house. This is the downtown, mm-hmm. Downton Abbey kind of uh, upbringing she has. She's a, a person of, of great means, of privilege, and somebody who in her early 20s seemed to be on the normal path um, you know, to, uh, to a life in polite society. Um, in what happened to her? You know, it's hard to say. That's one of the one of the themes of this book. So when she was 18, her parents, and you describe them very well, um, very wealthy people, their expectation, of course, was that she would be a debutante. And it was an incredibly important year, uh, 1958, because the queen had announced it would be the last time that women would be presented before her as debutantes. So it was a really... Uh, major event. Um, And she didn't want to do it. This wasn't her style. She didn't Mm -hmm. like being dragged out in front of men, uh, as she described it, sort of like a a, a shopping shopping market for men to choose their wives and such. And this is, you know, I I really enjoy doing the book because I like, I really enjoy history. And this is sort of recent history, relatively 1974. Mm -hmm. And you look at the way women are depicted then and the way and just even societal norms. So she doesn't want to do the debutante ball. So she has to make a deal with her parents. And the deal is their parents would allow her to attend Oxford in return Mm. for her doing the debutante ball. So imagine your daughter now saying, I want to attend Oxford and you begrudgingly (laughs) uh, acquiescing, right? No, oh, what a life that must be to have those choices. And it's funny because in the book you mentioned that these debutante balls come to a close because essentially it's become slim pickings. Yes, and and, uh, and um, Princess Margaret says so. She she says some derogatory things about about the young women that have been brought before the queen, as, um, insinuating that they buy the position. But of course they did. I mean, it wasn't like there was any type of egalitarianism about who was going to be presented before Elizabeth II. Um, but they just felt it was a dog and pony show and they shouldn't do it anymore. Right. I think tarts from London may have been uh, used at some point in there. <laughs> That's right. So what I love about this book is that it, it seems to be such a good parallel for a lot of what's going on now. If you just look at... Um, you just look at a lot of these folks, Antifa, et cetera. There are a lot of people who have lives of privilege and who essentially have cast off all this, this leg up that they, they've gotten, or maybe not cast it off, actually, because I guess Ro- Rose Dugdale didn't really cast it off, or at least not in the first or so decade she was out there. Um, but it, it, it's interesting that she seems to be a, a, precur- a good socialist precursor to, uh, to what we see in the streets now. I'm so glad you caught on to that, Tom, because that was a theme that I thought about throughout writing the book. It wasn't intentional, but uh, for instance, if you ever see Tucker Carlson talking about Antifa, he refers to them as unemployable grad students. <laughs> and uh, Rose was sort of an unemployable grad student. Um, she was, and she was a little older than the other revolutionaries of her time. So when you see her, a big defining moment in her life is Castro in 1968 invites college students in young, quote, quote, unquote, intellectuals to come see the, um, the results of his great revolution. She goes, but she's older than many of the other students. And a lot of them are true, truly grew up to become public intellectuals. Like Christopher Hitchens was there when she huh? went. Oh, no. Yeah, um, he, it, when you read his writings about that summer in Cuba, you can see that he saw the problems with Castro, but not Rose. She just fell in love with it. And she was, uh, just enthralled with everything she saw about revolution. Um, so when she came home, and by home I mean England, mm-hmm. she um, uh, just had inside of her that she would be working for what we now call social justice, um, and that's that's who she was. Was was she more of a of a deep, rigid ideologue, or was from the accounts you got from her? Was she casting off um, her upbringing just out of a spent a, a sense of you know normal youth rebellion and wanting to piss people off in her circles who would be uh, horribly offended by her choices? No, I think she really was a true believer. Uh, she made no bones about saying how much she disapproved of her family. She would, in her in her frequent appearances in criminal court, 
she would um, use the opportunity inspired by the Black Panthers in the United States mm -hmm. to use the court as a bully pulpit. And she would get up and give her thoughts about the rich. And she famously said at one of them, uh, her parents would always be there. They never stopped giving her money. Um, but she would say, uh, I love you, daddy, but I hate everything you stand for. To the point where when she had given away all of her money, a lot of it to her boyfriend, um, a, a fellow socialist who I'll point out took the money and bought himself a brand new Mercedes Benz <laughs> of course. that he could, he could wear. Um, uh, he's, he helped me with this book. He's a great guy, frankly, uh, 94 years old and still wants to be referred to as an, as a revolutionary. But she, um, when she ran out of money, the plan was just like you see with some people now back to mommy and daddy. But this time she broke into their home their gigantic country estate in Devon. Um, uh, you know, we would say Devonshire, but it's Devonshire mm -hmm. in, uh, in Great Britain. And she broke in and stole a whole bunch of art and antiques from her family uh, because she needed money. So in this, in, is this where the trial resulted in he got sent up for, for five or seven years and she essentially got probation? You have a great memory. That's exactly right. And it's a great scene. The courtroom scene is right out of something on television. She, she, he is sentenced to six years and he gets up. Now, keep in mind, he's sentenced for six years for a, a home burglary. Right. And his quote to the court is not since Christ has there been a bigger travesty of justice, you know, like this, <laughs> you know, uh, and then she gets up and the judge in an equally a uh, hyperbolic statement says to her, you, uh, you can go free. You're, he gets her a suspended sentence with a fine and because the likelihood of you reoffending is remote. You clearly right. have fallen under the influence of this man, <laughs> but it's such a great book for women and for the times, because the book proves that in fact, these men fell under her influence. She was the leader in the dynamic right. figure that these men buckled for. And not because she was a great beauty, which she wasn't, just because she was so dynamic and because she was smart and a true believer. So the judge then, um, and before I keep going too far, we we're talking about the book, The Woman Who Stole Vermeer, the true story of Rose Dugdale in the Rustboro House Art Heist. It is written by Anthony Amori. So the judge sends the boyfriend up, tells her to go in the straight and narrow. And I assume, Anthony, then the book just ends there with her straightening out her life, <laughs> quietly going into obscurity. It could, but uh, unfortunately for many, it did not. So it's a great character study because at the time when they were arrested, you know, she's thrilled by this, the, the notoriety. She's thrilled by it because she is being accepted. She sees it as her that's her true debutante ball, her being arrested, right? So she, <laughs> she, she and Wally, the boyfriend, had been running guns to the IRA. And when he goes to jail, she visits him faithfully and says she'll always be by his side, essentially. And then after, I don't know, I think it was a month or so, maybe two months, she just took off and went to Ireland and immediately took up with this man called Mad Eddie Gallagher, who was such a rash and violent and um, uh, just a firebrand that the IRA kept him at arm's length because, mm -hmm. you know, if you study the IRA, you know that there was a structure and they had strategy behind whatever things they were doing. He had no strategy. It was just action. And that's the perfect fit for Rose, this direct action of its time that the two undertake. And she goes on a crime spree that boggles your mind when you read about it. Hmm. So... It is fascinating, this sort of how she's going and sort of, like you said, these men are falling under her spell almost because she's a woman of such character and so much charisma that she's sort of pushing them al along with her like plans. And so, you know, you mentioned in the book that you don't think this was her first um, sort of big art heist, too. And this, I mean... What do you think it was for her? Do you think it was like the the love of the thrill of doing the crime? I mean, I know you say she's a true believer, too. But so is it more just that kind of the, the adrenaline rush that she's getting from living this lifestyle and from, you know, taking these men along with her for the ride? Like, what was the appeal for her? Why not go back to the life, the easy life after all that? I think um, she was a 
person who was really committed to this movement in the late 60s and early 70s of direct action, Mm -hmm. which meant if you had a cause to believe in, it wasn't enough to hand out pamphlets or nowadays to blog or say things on social media. You, You would have to take action. She committed to herself that if she had to kill people, she would. And in fact, before she pulls off another art heist, what she does with Mad Eddie is remarkable. They take these milk churns and they pack them by hand with explosives. They hijack a helicopter and they try to drop these bombs on a police barracks in Straban, which is at the time the most bombed out, attacked place in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And they drop these milk churns and miss their targets. And it's fascinating to me because the police tell the press, you know, we watched this with amusement and we chuckled as they missed and these fell harmlessly into the water. But make no mistake, the police were not really chuckling. This woman would have killed everybody in sight if these bombs had hit their target. They, they were on to her at that point, and they um, started put, putting up wanted posters, and they were looking for her very um, uh, fiercely. So mm-hmm. even the wanted posters insult her. They, they say she has mannish appearance, oh. sallow eyes, dirty clothes. They put a really ugly photo of her on them. But now she's a big target for the for the um, special branch. Mm-hmm. And uh, she must that, have loved know, that too, right? She, oh my God, the, you know, there's a great picture of her coming out of a police station with Walter Heat and her boyfriend. And uh, he looks downtrodden because he's been through it before and he doesn't want to go to jail. And she couldn't look happier. <laughs> everything for Rose, when you think about her background, everything for her would be to get her bona fides, right? To mm-hmm. actually be a revolutionary. And at the same time she's doing this, there's a woman, and I, I, being a pop, being a, playing pop psychologist, I'd say if she could have been anyone in the world, she would have been a woman named Dolores Price, who was one of the first women in the IRA. She led the bombing of the Old Bailey. It was the first bombing, bombing in England since the Second World War. She pulled off this major car bomb and maimed hundreds of people. Dolores Price, a real... Irish woman from Northern Ireland goes to prison with her younger sister and they immediately go on a hunger strike and it catches world headlines. So you cannot be more of the real deal than Dolores Price. And Rose was trying to shake off this aristocratic upbringing that Tom described really well. Mm -hmm. So I think that propelled her, Alice. I think that made her want to be even more, um, Active in, she had to violence. prove she wasn't just play acting along with the the you know other rich people who sometimes kind of dabble in those movements. She had to prove that she really meant it. Perfectly stated. You're right. Yep. And she so she went on to um to that's what brought her to the Rustborough House. So and that's where the big that's where the big hit is. Um, the big score is, I guess we, we should say, and there's it's not only Vermeer art that's there, uh, Vermeer pieces, but there's a whole array of rare art, right? Yep. So this house that she broke into, she posed as a damsel in distress with a French accent, knocked on the uh, servants' quarters door, and the biggest, longest house in all of Ireland, and um, she she talks her way in, and as soon as they open the door, two guys come in with machine guns, and they. They take the staff and they secure them gently. But when they get the people who own the house, these two gazillionaires, Sir Alfred and Lady Bate, they get them and they, um, I I should have said Bite. I always get that name wrong. Sir Alfred and Lady Bite are just out of a movie, right? They're in their study, this enormous Mm -hmm. house, listening to their phonograph, as Joe Biden would uh, (laughs) describe it. And uh, they break in, they smack Sir Alfred in the head, they hogtie these people. They call them capitalist pigs over and over, really giving out, giving away who they are. And then in a in a in a criminal act that's never been repeated or preceded, Rose points out the paintings that the thieves should take from all of the art they have. She picks 19 and she picks it very well. She picks in only the way a well-educated um, mm-hmm. aristocrat would, mm-hmm. you know, because your average thief that you that you hear about is who usually steals paintings. They don't know Vermeer. Mm-hmm. They don't know Rubens. She did. And that's why their hall was the biggest art theft of its time. Hmm. Wow. Were those choices um, the best choices? Because certainly they would be extremely valuable, but also easier to fence. 
They would be very, very hard to fence, almost impossible. Um, oh. But what may, another thing that makes her unique, aside from her gender, is that uh, she did it for political reason. Usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, this is done for money. Mm -hmm. She did it for ransom. So it wasn't about how much she could get money-wise. She understood these were national treasures. And there's a scene in the book, which I love so much, is that the police, the detectives in Ireland get word that there's a multi-million dollar heist. Yeah. And one of the detectives says, there's not a million dollar painting in the whole of Ireland. <laughs> like people didn't know, huh. you know, and they, they rush there and they find in today's dollars, that heist was well over a hundred million easily. Three Rubens of Vermeer, Van de Velde, uh, Goya, unbelievable. Yeah. Now that's interesting. So I was going to ask this kind of because one... Um, one book I read a long time ago, it was called The Museum of the Missing, and it was about famous stolen artwork. Mm -hmm. And and one of the points that I'd never really thought about that the book made is that a lot of times when paintings get stolen, they just go missing and don't show up again because they are so hard to fence because they're one, there's one of them. So, you know, anytime, anytime you try and sell it, it's linked back to you. So it's very, it's very hard to do it without people figuring out it was you that stole it. So um, that was kind of one of the major through lines of the book was like people steal this art and then they realize they can't do anything with it. They're just stuck with it. So it's like worth the money, um, but but not necessarily to the person who steals it, you know, that they might not exactly be able to right. get the auction price for it. Um, so So it's interesting that she chose to steal art and not, you know, money or not hold people for ransom. It's sort of not your typical IRA crime that you think of, you know? And it's not. I, that's a great, great point. So she understood that stealing art would get a lot of attention because she had stolen art from her parents' house. And it was a big deal. It was headlines all over the, the, the world. Couldn't believe it that this, and even in America, it was reported because this PhD from Oxford did, did an art heist. What is this? You know, yeah. she understood that it would get a, a lot of attention. So that's what brought her to, you know, again, do this because she wasn't looking for money from this thing. And you're right. I know that book you mentioned well, mm -hmm. and that's what happens when people steal masterpieces. And I'm sure it's true of the Gardner that the thieves the next morning woke up and said, my God, this is, I can't believe how much these things are worth. They instantly become too recognizable to sell. Mm -hmm. Right. They can only get you in trouble. So people hide them, which makes it way harder to find them. Right. That's Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Massachusetts. <laughs> if uh, if people aren't uh, aware, what was that? Ninety one, Anthony. Nineteen ninety. Nineteen ninety. Yeah, a heist with. When again, gullible security answered the door <laughs> and uh, and uh, don't answer the door. Is that the <laughs> All that. So, you know, I'm look. You, I, I, just reading what I've read so far from the book. The book is, by the way, The Woman Who Stole Vermeer, the true story of Rose Dugdale and the Rustboro House art heist. And it seems to me, one, it's 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 interesting because it's really recent history. This is just the counterculture movement. This is during, you know, the during the era of Woodstock and and um and I mean that's the, the, the soft side of the counterculture movement, but it's hers is obviously the rough insurgent side. Uh she's Seems like a, a a mix of Patty Hearst and maybe a somewhat uh, the the uh, the um, Charles Manson family and mm. um, and uh, a little bit of uh, Clockwork Orange actually, <laughs> um, but in well actually in, during that time as well you know there were hundreds of bombings mm -hmm. and things in the, in the United States, so mm -hmm. I mean this stuff was uh, seemed to be commonplace but was the art part of this commonplace the terrorism was commonplace we know that but was the art part of it were heists something that came into vogue or was she a woman alone in this woman alone and still a woman alone no other woman's done this but i would say you're exactly right there were heists but it was always money it would be bank heists right. back then people would do there's no there's no reason to steal art um the ira didn't sanction this uh in fact what's really kind of poignant is that when rose goes and steals these paintings her met her her goal is to trade them to the British authorities in return for Dolores Price and her sister being treated as political prisoners and sent to Northern Ireland to finish their terms, to end the hunger strike. And the Price sisters say to, through the media, 
please just give the Vermeers back. Ooh. We don't want we don't want this. We don't want to be moved back to Northern Ireland as a ransom. They wanted it, they wanted to be moved as political prisoners on a principle. So Rose did all of this, and the subjects that she tried to help didn't want it. The IRA didn't sanction this. They were doing their own work to try to have ceasefires here or maybe violence elsewhere. This was a distraction. So she hurt her cause. Rose hurt her cause with the IRA, though her intentions were good. It's interesting. It's it's almost as if she she's not good at Plan B or the second half of Plan A because when she when she guiped the ark from her own parents, it didn't take them very long to bust her. And after this, at the at the Rustboro House, I mean that was fairly. It, it was short lived, right? Very quick. Yeah, she was not a great criminal tactician, but again, for her, it was just direct action. Uh, I'm just going to do this. Hmm. Let's do it. Let's take those paintings. We can do it. And they always say about masterpiece uh, heists that the art of it is not um, in stealing the stuff, it's moving the stuff. So even for her, though she wasn't looking for money, her idea of using it for ransom didn't work either. That is remarkable. That is remarkable that she's got this this particular psychological makeup and is certainly extremely – part of it, you wonder, and you've done all the work, you wonder, is she an advanced, highly intelligent um, kind of a troublemaker or is she simply a really bored, rich woman looking for excitement or a little bit of both? I think it's the former. I think she um, is a person who is just driven for a cause, can't shake it. That's what she's going to do with her life. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. There's no man that's going to stand in her way. This is what she wanted. She wanted to be doing direct action, period. And that's what she did. So did uh, her prison sentence change her? I've just I've seen all sorts of... Uh... Irish articles um, from the time saying she's finally finished her sentence, et cetera. Was she reformed? Is she, um, I mean, how did she come out of jail? Well, when she came out of jail um, and we won't even get into it, but all kinds of things happen in jail, remarkable things, first time ever things in Irish history. But when she comes out, she becomes very active again. She starts working um, with the IRA, though the IRA is not officially involved in trying to rid the area of drugs Drugs are really becoming a problem in um, in Dublin, where she's living. So she's working on that front. And then she winds up joining Sinn Féin, uh, working in education for Sinn Féin. Um, but she becomes an inspiration, which is interesting because now the IRA finally has accepted her. And in her late life, you see photos of her with Jerry Adams, um, whereas that was unthinkable when she really was being a one man, you know, the one man's terrorist is right. another freedom right. fighter. It's interesting. You would yeah. have thought, considering we live in a world where, uh, you know, Bill Ayers has tenure, you would have thought she would have gone into academia again. Well, but I think there's a similarity there a little bit. You know, I, that's kind of what I was thinking while you were talking, how it's funny, like, these terrorists from this era, they all kind of come out like Angela Davis, too. They come out and, and they're sort of treated like, it's fine, like, and kind of, especially on the left, they sort of just, like, bring them in and act like everything's normal, and, like, the IRA didn't even want anything to do with her when she was actually doing things, and, like, now it's like, oh, yeah, she's great, she's just one of the guys, like, we'll just take her back, and, you know, you think of somebody even, like, Lin-Manuel Miranda um, defends that guy, who's the California guy? That he loves Lin Manuel Miranda. Is it Mumia? Is that how is, is he name? one of the Mumia oh, guys? Oh, he loves him. The cop killer. Yeah, and and you think like, do these people not know what these people did? Do they not know what Bill Ayers did? But it's just like that's how the old radicals grew up, and now they're just like part of academia, part of the establishment. Now that's that's really troublesome too, though. I have to you know be betraying my political leanings, but when you <laughs> when you think about Mumia, for instance, and and there is no question. No reasonable person could ever think that he didn't murder that police officer. And all of these celebrities and people on the left just rallying around him and almost none of them rallying around the police officer's wife who had young children and lost her husband. Uh, No one thinks that he wasn't a good guy or a good cop or a good dad. And 
nobody cares at all about that aspect of it. They just celebrate Mumia because he wrote, I don't know, he wrote some poems or something in prison. He murdered a human being yes. in cold blood. And, uh, and the same with Bill Ayers and Bernadette Dorn and the rest of them. It's as if, if your cause is okay with the left, you can do almost anything. Um, and there, so there's, I, I think that comes back to academia where uh, there's just a, a bias. Yeah, well, ain't that the truth? You look at the Weather Underground, they killed a cop in Brighton, Massachusetts, you know, and you, just, right. just down the street at Harvard. No, 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 Bill Ayers is a, you know, it will always be a legend, you know, for everything that, 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 that he was in on, including bombing the hell out of a lot of uh, police uh, installations in New York. You know, it... One of oh, the things- sorry, it wasn't Mumia. It was uh, the Puerto Rican terrorist Oscar Lopez Rivera. Oh, is that the one that Obama pardoned? Um, I'm not sure. Got to be more specific, uh, Anthony. Which, it could have been any Puerto number of terrorist? them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, yeah. while we're looking for this, is another thing that's that I love. It, by the way, I, I don't, and I know that she was a violent criminal, Anthony. But I would have fallen in love with Rose Dugdale. She is exciting. She has. She was packed with money. I mean, at that time, mm-hmm. she was probably a little bit crazy. She was always up for a good time. It seems like no one told her what to do. There's a chance I would end up dead. It was just, just kind of the yeah. unhealthy relationship that seems like uh, <laughs> that would have uh, would have drawn me into. I mean, did you f- find her? You must have. You wrote all about her. You must have found her just an intriguing person. Without a doubt. And I was intrigued by her initially because every time I'd read something about her, it'd be wrong or inconsistent with, with, other, with what other people were saying. So I said, I'm going to take the, take the leap and, and learn all about her. And the, her story is just so remarkable. We just skimmed the surface of it now. And, and um, it's hard to write a biography of somebody and not form, form some sort of, I don't even want to say affection, but some sort of bond with their life because you delve into it so deeply and you want to know so much about them. But um, I abhor the things she did. I mean, the bombing would have killed, you know, again, like we were just saying about the police officer in Philly, if she had dropped those bombs on that, um, on the Ulster, Royal Ulster um, Constabulary, husbands and sons and brothers and nephews would have been murdered and slaughtered. Um, it's not a funny thing. So, you know, I don't, I don't, sometimes we'll talk to people who are um, thinking about making this into a film and such, and you've got to remind them, this is not campy. This is serious stuff. Yeah. You know, and uh, she's a dichotomy in the sense too, because she was ready and she did the act. She executed the act of trying to commit grisly large scale murder but at the same time, she still kept some of her um, upscale kind of peccadillos, I guess. She still attended the opera and did the finer things. I mean, to me, that just really jumps out that she's, there was still, she was a cafeteria white collar person. Right. Yeah. Like so many. And I mean, she, um, she, she did keep a lot of those things, but I'll tell you in the very end, I mean, now she's 80 years old and. She doesn't live in, uh, she lives, I don't, I don't want to say, she lives a very modest, a very modest life in Dublin, doesn't seek any attention, turns away journalists and reporters. Hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the Irish have really accepted her for that because a long, for a long time they doubted her commitment. They thought maybe she was just having fun. But now there's no denying she was um, a true believer. By the way, you should be following Anthony Amore on Twitter, and he is at Anthony Amore. Once again, Anthony M. Anthony oh, M. Amore. I'm sorry about that, Anthony M. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Anthony some M. kid took my name. <laughs> I, I realize. <laughs> and um, and the book is called "The Woman Who Stole Vermeer: The True Story of Rose Dugdale in the Rustboro House Art Heist." Um, Alice, unless you have something else, I will. So let me tell you, folks that Anthony, I cannot believe. I went and I read a couple of reviews of the book as well. And I know you and I know your politics and people, if you want to see Anthony's politics, I would say he is a conservative. <laughs> but buy the book regardless because he's an author and he's a great historian, etc. I cannot believe the absolute love the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times gave this book. Oh, 
right? No one tell them. <laughs> oh, I held my breath. I held my breath. I wondered, you know, if the is the will the reviewer have read my tweets? And I, and they they came out. The reviews happened while I was really heavily working on working against ranked choice voting. Ooh. And I was very vocal yeah. about it. And I said, you know, you got to. I'm no different than Rose. You got to pursue the stuff you believe in. And I, I, I said, I'm going to work really hard against this thing. And um, mm-hmm. luckily that didn't interfere with the, with the, <laughs> with the yeah. reviews. And they're great reviews. I mean, what everything that I've read so far is it's just fascinating. I'm just, I, I can't believe that I didn't know more about her. Once again, the book is a woman who stole over me the true story of Rose Dugdale in the Rustboro house art heist. Anthony Amore. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you both. <laughs> Always great talking to Anthony Amore, hearing about the predecessors of the squad, and Rose was one of those. Although, it, to their, I guess, credit, the squad has yet to <laughs> try to drop a bomb on a police precinct. So far, so far. Right. Though uh, Those adjacent to them have. Certainly. Oh, and they certainly, I mean, Obama himself pardoned um, the person that I was talking about that Lynn mm-hmm. manuel Miranda loved that was a Puerto Rican terrorist. Um nationalist so you know like the it's all the these groups you know they're radical at the time and then they sort of move into polite society and mm-hmm. become really the establishment now obama's the establishment and the squad's too far for him you know the terrorists no not so right much, but Isn't the squad is too far for him so by the way the book is available everywhere you can get it on uh, amazon i'm looking at the amazon page right now um, get it while you can, though, because the literary community is under siege, under attack, as everybody is, and anybody whose who's, um, who's endeavors tend to be either moderate or progressive, those are the easy kills for the movement, so they go for them first, and it's happening right now in those literary circles. Right. So this started with a uh, YA children's book author. And if you don't follow Jesse Single on Twitter, you should because he's written extensively about um, the YA, that's young adult publishing community, and how they've just become so woke that it's like intolerable. They routinely lead Twitter mobs to cancel authors, get their books canceled from publication, you know, because they represent a minority the wrong way or they don't... Whatever. They're extremely woke and they're extremely cancely. So anyway, this um, this YA author, Ellen O, oh, she's an Asian-American YA author. Um, I think she writes about like dragons or something. I don't know. Uh, but so she said, this year we should do a worst classic books ever list and why they should not be taught in K through 12 schools anymore because they cause kids to hate reading. So she goes through um, Moby Dick, Catcher in the Rye. Uh, Adventures of Huck Finn, It's Racist, The Canterbury Tales, Why, Why, she says, um, Scarlet Letter, The Writing Sucks, she says, um, As I Lay Dying by <laughs> Faulkner is Boring, Anything by Hemingway because he's a misogynist, um, she continues on. So people are not pleased with this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, right, normal human beings, because these are some of people people's favorite books that's why they're so famous and why they continue to get taught and um you know she was jumped in and defended by this fellow david o bowles who's a professor and has since made his twitter private who called everybody worms and says he speaks 12 languages and how dare they attack her and and, um and he thinks we should cancel all the classic books too because young people need to read things that are written in their vernacular language that they speak that means no shakespeare that means they need to be reading you know books also written by kids who speak you know Spanish at home and speak English at school and are written by people with their same experience because heaven forbid you should have to learn about somebody else's experiences other than yours so in any case um, so then uh, they got yelled at him so the latest casualty uh, of all this is um, another YA book author they got into an argument about it because uh, one YA book author felt that the attacks on the classics uh, were not warranted. And she got into an argument on Twitter with another YA book author who is um, Hispanic in origin. Uh. And uh, so this author, Jess Keir, who's the one who's now canceled forever, said, "These are this is what got her canceled. 
This is extremely racist. Just, I'm going to warn you in advance. Okay. Content warning. If you think Hawthorne was on the side of the judgmental Puritans in the Scarlet Letter, you are an absolute idiot and should not have the title of educator in your Twitter bio. This anti-intellectual, anti-curiosity BS is poison, Ooh. and I will stand here and scream that it is sheer evil until my hair falls out. I do not care. Ah, yes, that embodiment of brutal subjugation and toxic masculinity, Walden, sit and spin on attack, she said. Oh, let's get her on. And then let's she said, oh, she's not going to be a good guest anymore because she's already oh, is that bent the knee. Oh, um, so, oh, yeah. okay. Remember how Louisa May Alcott wrote Little Women to uphold the patriarchy? If you do, stop taking drugs, you hack. Nice. John Steinbeck writing with sneering disgust about agricultural laborers and the graves of wrath and mice and men. Is that what I would say if I were a so-called educator if who was in fact a charlatan? Remember the horrible lessons learned from The Wizard of Oz and its total dearth of interesting female characters? Then be honest, you haven't read it, you tool of idiocracy. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> remember their eyes were... God, where has this person been? Ah, uh, yes. Remember their eyes were watching God and other literature of the extraordinary Harlem Renaissance? I guess not, Dick. Jesus. So that's what she said. Uh, so then, haha. Um, her agent put out the following statement because people were screaming at him too. Mm -hmm. I thank everyone who took it upon themselves to bring the recent tweets of my client, Jessica Kluas, to my attention. I also apologize for taking so long to publicly respond, but I felt obligated to speak directly with my client and then gather my thoughts before making any sort of public statement. That is not allowed. You're not allowed to go talk to the person before no, you no. denounce them. Let me be clear. Jessica's behavior yesterday in which she made a series of condescending and personal attacks on a Dominican American woman educator was deeply problematic and inexcusable. It is yet another example of the white privilege and systemic power imbalance that pervades Jesus. the publishing industry and this country. I care very much for Jessica and I also hold her accountable for her actions. I realize that my silence up to now may have given the impression that I'm indifferent different to what took place yesterday. That's the... What an agent. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mr. CYA. Or even that I am complicit. I promise this. Oh, I am listening. I, I am, promise it's just her. I am working to elevate the voices of those who have been historically marginalized Jesus, in our industry. what a way to live. And I, and I am committed... What a way to live. I am committed to engaging in the hard conversations needed to move us all forward together. And so then she uh, also put out a statement uh, now. More, it's explicitly this agent is not willing to engage in the hard conversations right. nor are any of the people with the pitchforks around him or her mm -hmm. so then uh jess Clues was uh pressed into making, is she re-educated she is now re-educated this is why we can't have her on as a guest now um she says this is an apology for lorena herman and all those who follow me including my readers educators and my publisher i am writing to apologize for a thread i tweeted yesterday i take full responsibility for my unprovoked anger toward lorena herman and all the impact of my words on her and all who read them i neither expect nor will ask for anyone's forgiveness or to engage with me further regarding this issue i can't think i can hear her loading the gun <laughs> I want to acknowledge the pain I have caused and to apologize sincerely for it. My words were misguided, wrong, and deeply hurtful. I must and will do better moving forward. I am committed to learning more about Ms. Hermann's important work with Disrupt Texts. I d agree that what counts as canon in literature changes over time and that it can be and should be contested and expanded to other, more inclusive kinds of text. Again, I am deeply sorry. I will strive to do better. Now, I'll let you take a guess whether or not this apology was satisfactory. Uh, I would say negative. Yeah, no. Um, if you are about the public record, you need to include all the tweets you published. This apology rings very hollow. A tepid blanket apology to everyone as if your targeted attack on Lorena harmed your publisher the same way is unacceptable. The intensity of your remorse really pales compared to the vitriol of your thread. This smacks of spin, not sincerity. Oh, Jesus. And the racism. She didn't acknowledge how deeply racist her tirade <clears throat> was. It's Jess, uh, next time, go on Instagram stories and, and self-immolate, please, okay? And then maybe you'll be considered as having been recalcitrant. Is it recalcitrant? Um, yes. Thank you. And then, yeah, uh, it's missing the words violence and racism. It has the whiff oh. of an apology someone told her she needed what to write. What a bunch of horrible people. Oh, no what a one bunch else of can solve you. That's on people. you. It's in you. Find out why. <laughs> Jesus. So we're really good. We're all the really good people. So you have to be destroyed now. No, we're not going to accept your apology. No, because we're really good. You don't get it.
Jessica, your only mistake was apologizing. Right. The right. only thing you had wrong in that whole thread was apologizing. Remember, uh, Heaven forbid that, you defend Steinbeck or Hemingway. Remember the great uh, masterpiece movie, um, Predator. If it bleeds, <laughs> we can kill it. And so when they right. tell that you can bleed, they know they, they can Blood kill it. Blood in the water. The sharks uh, are circling. And all these Terrible. people... Two more hogs got the fever. All those hogs got the fever. And they're never going to be able to reason with you. Ever, ever, ever. Oh, that's a happy, uplifting story. What a bunch of <laughs> jerks. What a bunch of jerks. That's why I say books is dumb, Alice. Books is dumb. D-U-M. I mean, I Tom like, Shattuck. There are some good books. going books. on my mugs, there are some by the good way. Books. Anthony Amore's book. Let me know, other than the Anthony Amore book, other than... The woman who stole Vermeer, nice catch, Alice. The woman who stole <laughs> Vermeer, the true story of Rose Dugdale in the Rustboro house, house uh, art heist. Um, yeah, I have, I have a very small quarter for these folks. Alice, but it's going to be interesting to see now because you have the publishing industry is going crazy over the Jordan Peterson book. Now this, they're consolidating mm. somebody... One of the places just bought Penguin. They're all consolidating more and more. There's fewer and fewer. Pretty big soon name it's going to be. You know what? It's going to be the Obama book too. Right. Then they're going to go for. Yeah, I um, mean Obama is supporting Netflix. white supremacy right now. Is he not the yes, he racist is. white supremacist police force? Yes. He's for them, so he's against Black Lives. Mm -hmm. And you know why should they publish his book when there's so many more deserving people like Cory Bush and AOC and Rashida Tlaib who should have their memoirs published? So, you know, this is we're just going to see more of this, and more and more people are going to go to self-publishing because that's. You know the the way it's going to be moving forward, yeah. especially with an agent like that who needs <laughs> who needs enemies. That before, poor Jessica's agent. Before we go, else we do have an update on some of our elected leaders who oh, really? have chosen. No, I think uh, oh. I think you sent that to me. That yes. there's there are more elected leaders who have mm -hmm. decided to uh, decided not to heed their own COVID warnings, even though they sternly sternly lectured you about them. Uh, they uh, are trying to do a little uh, carpe dieming themselves, mm -hmm. and they have no time for these constraints on their own fun and freedom. Are you going to play something? Or no. I supposed to talk? Yeah, I'm just waiting for you to talk. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to play your montage again of all the different um, people who've been caught doing it. Yes, the latest is John Bell Edwards. We had the San Jose mayor yesterday. I think I mistakenly called him the El Paso mayor yesterday because the El Paso mayor was also in the mm -hmm. news. But he's the mayor of San Jose, got caught doing it. The mayor, I mean, all these mayors, all these governors, John Bell Edwards is a governor. Gavin Newsom's a governor. They're going, the French Laundry, by the way, one of the articles said that it's $350 a person to eat there. Yeah, no, the, the Newsom, the Newsom bill was fifteen grand, I think. Yeah, I believe it. And that's, and, I mean, and that means that there was some drinking happening. Drinking and oh, hanging yeah. out and so, rollicking, frolicking. Yeah, you know, they're having a great time. You can't see your family. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. But uh, they can all have a good time. It's the same thing we saw here. Karen Polito and had her very nice party with all her family members over. She was there having a good time out and in the And when backyard. they get busted. I'm going to start with this top question that viewers have been asking us since Wednesday. Will you resign? No. No, no equivocation. Do you feel like that's no. even an appropriate no. question? No. Yeah, it's over. No, I already said I'm sorry. So that's that's a, it's over. Yeah. You know, it's not as if uh, you know I yelled at people for criticizing Moby Dick, something unforgivable <laughs> like that. I just simply <laughs> broke all the rules that I'm making you abide by, and the businesses abide by, and torpedoing livelihoods of people. You know, and then broke my own rules mm -hmm. and enjoyed life, which I won't let anybody yeah. else do. In the meantime, there's three women in Nashville who are facing criminal charges for uh, having a Halloween party a month ago. They're they're uh, have a court date in a couple. That of weeks. is, <laughs> and they could get up to a on. year in prison. But you know, when the governors do it, they're just deeply sorry, and it's. Just Another day on the job for them. They are very important, and they have families right. to see and stuff. So, and yeah. all that means is, is it, you know, it, that means that twenty twenty two is going to be an interesting year. Mm -hmm. This all this madness continues. All this madness continues. You're going to have Trump out there picking, you know, acting as kingmaker, using the continued exuberance of his following, which is huge, and Democrats will not be able to compete. People, everyday Americans who have spent this year being completely engaged, they're going back to 
you know, watching whatever new iteration of West Wing there is and pretending that that's happening at the White House, they're going to be disengaged. So Republicans, it it reminds me of, of like whatever army that was in one of the Lord of the Rings things where they're just watching all the other people fight forever and all the huge armies coming together with the way over the top CGI. Mm-hmm. That's what it's going to look like for the Democrats here. And it's wonderfully entertaining wonderfully entertaining but it's a free exchange of ideas and debate in the political forum everybody should c- celebrate that and i certainly do we're the burn barrel podcast you can find us on twitter at burn barrel pod um you can follow our author guest anthony amore on twitter at anthony m amore you can also check out our podcast on facebook.com slash burn barrel podcast parlor at burn barrel podcast send us an email burn barrel podcast at gmail.com and check out our youtube channel you can like our videos watch us uh talk there and subscribe wow i say life